Take care. Bye. Just hold this for me so I can read it. You, you can just get the slate in, correct? Yeah. Okay, whenever you're ready. Yeah. August 11, 1996, the survivor is Martin Greenfield. The interviewer is Anne Bernard. The interview was taking place in Long Island, the United States of America, and the interview was taking place in English. August 11, 1996, the survivor is Martin Greenfield. The interview was taking place in Long Island. I'm the interviewer. My name is Anne Bernard, and the interview was taking place in English. You didn't get me kidding around there, did you? <laughs> did you? No, we're fine. No, we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Good morning. Morning. Could you tell me your name? Martin Greenfield. Were you born as a Greenfield? I was born as a Grunfeld. Could you spell that? G R U, you know, N F E L D. And where were you born? In Pavlovo, Czechoslovakia. Then. What is it today? Today it's Ukrainska. It belongs to the Russians. What year were you born? Um, a long time ago, 1928. How old are you? 68. Yesterday. Was it yesterday? Friday, August 9th. How many brothers and sisters did you have? Two sisters and one brother. What were their names? My older sister, my young, uh, I'm, I was the oldest. My uh, oldest sister next to me was Sima and Rupal, and Srobear was my brother. What were the difference in ages between the four of you? Well, one year apart was my older sister, I mean, who was next to me, and then two years after her was Rivka, and then my brother came later. He was born, he was only five years old. Yeah, he was taken away. Tell me about your parents, your father's name first. Hmm. My father's name was Joseph Yassel Kalman, Joseph Grunfeld. My mother's name was Celia. Berger was her uh, maiden name. My father was born in 1904, November the 4th. And my mother was born in 1908, but I don't remember the day of the birthday. What did your father do for a living? My father was an industrial engineer. He built most of Czechoslovakia, the roads and the bridges and all that stuff. I used to go with him on the, uh, during school break, he would take me. 
As a construction engineer, what exactly was he responsible for? To build roads, bridges, and uh, and in the winter time, and there's no building because it's too cold. The weather, he they were doing logging, you know, the t timber and all that stuff. That was uh, that was his job. Was he a supervisor? Well, they were con you know they contracted for the govern for the government. Him and there was another man that he first worked with the other men, and they were partners. And uh, when you are uh, an engineer, you don't work for the government direct. You just do contract work, and you get paid for whatever. And then he had a lot of people working for him. I used to do because all those jobs are are uh, you sleep outside in uh, tents and. All it was a lot of fun when I was a kid. That I used to go out on these trips during in between school breaks sometimes. Did any of your sisters go with him? No. They were all much younger. I was the, I was very young too, but uh, I guess he took me just to experience. It was nice. Good memories of those trips. It's called fishing. So um, we used to eat in the fields um, with the workers. It was nice. Did your mother prepare the food for those trips? No, because it was far away from home. It was done outside uh, in the fields. We did here. They called barbecues there. There was cookouts. All kinds. There are a lot of stuff we canned goods, sardines, and stuff like that stuff. We, we were kosher. So we ate kosher food mostly. I mean, probably everything is kosher. <clears throat> Was your family religious? We were brought up as Orthodox. My father was not a very religious man, and my mother either. But my grandparents were. So we were brought up in a religious upbringing of Orthodox. It was uh, not fanatic, but Orthodox. Did your grandparents live near you? My, my mother's parents lived with us. Until I remember my grandfather dying. My mother's uh, father, that was the first person I ever saw die. That was on a Saturday. And I remember that as clearly as I could ever see him close his eyes. And my father just covered them up because Saturday you're not allowed to move any dead person. It was there till Sunday he was buried. So they lived with us. And then my grandmother survived, uh, I mean survived, she lived with us until the gas, the gas chamber. How old were you when your grandfather died? My grandfather died. I couldn't be more than 10 years old, 11, something like that. I think 10 or 11. Were you close to him? In a way, well, he lived with us. He was originally, before he got very old, he was a teacher. So, uh, so evidently we must have been, cl I was closer to grandmother than to him. I don't know, for some reason he was always busy with books and stuff. Did your mother work? No. Nobody worked by us, only my father. But we had our own farm, you know, so on those days, the way we lived, everything was growing. Everything was fresh and everything was, we used our own land for, uh, I don't know uh, where, my mother didn't work the land or my grandmother, we had people you know, took care of them. We had our own uh, cows and we had our own chickens, we had our own everything. It was, it was baked, uh, they used to bake the bread, but it didn't go to bakeries. Everything was our own.
Was any of it sold to people in the town of Pavlova? No. Just for your own use. Or given away for poor people, but not sold. There's no such a thing as selling. None of the farms that produced was just for our own needs. We were not farmers. That was uh, to make a living of. Tell us about where you lived. We lived in a house. Uh, I'm just trying to think back. Uh, it wasn't a huge house. It was the bedrooms. I remember I slept in a room maybe with my sister. I think so. My parents' bedroom and my grandmother's in their bedroom, my grandparents. And I slept in a, we had about four rooms or something. You know, everything was in the days when I was brought up in Pavlova there was no electricity. Everything was you know, with the stoves and with uh, candle lights and gas, whatever, they, they burned kerosene lamps and stuff. And heat was, of course, generated from, from, from stoves. There was no central of anything. Our bathroom was outside the house. So uh, that's how we, we were brought up. Later, that changed. I went back to visit my dad. The house was still there, but they had then electricity, they had everything. Televisions, but not. But we didn't have any of that stuff. How did you get news of the um, world around you? Through newspapers. Through uh, newspapers. And, uh, we had no radios or any. Only communication we had was through newspapers and through discussions. I remember they had these political discussions with my father and my grandfather. What do they talk about? Talk about world events, because in those days things were Hitler was starting and it was in the days of what is going to happen or what isn't going to happen. And they talked about those things. Mostly my father only came home weekends. So it was only during the Shabbos uh, discussions, Friday night, Saturday. In the afternoon, uh, they would come together, and he, because my father traveled. And he, not everybody read those different papers, so they, the older people, they wanted to know from the younger people. My, my father used to travel, so he'd bring the news with him, the papers and everything. What language were the papers in? It was in, in I guess, in Czechoslovakian, but they also, you could get uh, Ukrainian, you know, Russian, and you could get uh, Hungarian, because a lot of them, this was Hungary before, so they had the Hungarian papers. And I don't remember if they had any Jewish papers, I don't think so. What was the language you all spoke? We spoke, at home we spoke Yiddish, and uh, the language from the school was, to me was Czech. My parents was Hungarian, so they spoke mostly Hungarian among themselves. And or Jewish we all understood, so I guess they spoke Hungarian because I did not understand Hungarian in those days, I do now. So when was Yiddish spoken? Yiddish was spoken and everybody should understand. But when they don't want the kids to understand something, they spoke their own language. Yiddish was spoken in general in every household in my town. And we were taught Yiddish and we were taught Hebrew. And starting when I was as far back as I could remember, two years, three years old, I was already started school, uh, Hebrew school. How many people would you estimate lived in Pavlova at that time? How many? Families, I would estimate, maybe uh, 40 families, Jewish families, or maybe more, something in that ballpark. See, the Jews lived by the street, by the main street. 
So I'm just thinking about the house. Maybe it was 50 families, the most. And if it's more, but they were big families in those days. We were not big, we were poor, but there were others, six, seven children, eight. It wasn't unusual to have that many children. And how many um, Czechs lived in the town? You mean, the people, while it was Czechoslovakia, but the people were mostly Ukraine people. You know, the religion was the Greek Orthodox religion. And they must have been, maybe they were in the whole town, maybe there were a thousand people, a couple of thousand people or more. You know, you can't reflect the numbers because when I went back with my son uh, to see the town, everything that was big to me was small now. So I don't know. It was, it was a sizable town, but it's spread out through beautiful lands and hills, and it's just a beautiful place that I came from. Could you describe your memories of what Shabbos was like? Shabbos was, uh, well, it started with Friday. Everybody was going to the mikveh, which is a bad house. And, uh, and you waited, my father would come home, it was a big deal for me because he wasn't home a whole week. And then, uh, of course, Friday morning, I remember before I went to Heder, Heder used to be before school. So they get you up about six o'clock in the morning, go to Heder, winter or summer or whatever, I don't know. And then you go to school. So in between, you have breakfast. Then you come home for lunch from school when you finish. Then you go to Heder again. So on Friday, it, it started, when I got up, baking was done already. They were baking maybe from 2, 3 o'clock in the morning because they took the hollows and the cakes and the, whatever they prepared. And then on Friday, before the Sabbath, they would prepare the children first because they didn't cook during the Sabbath day. Everything was prepared, so it was a very busy day in the kitchen, I remember. And everything was usually Friday. You could get fresh everything. Because that was the day of the baking for the whole week. And, and, and Friday night, of course, we went to shul. And, uh, and then we had our big Friday night dinner. See, in those days, even if you had or didn't have, I don't remember, we did not eat too much meat. We had our own chickens and, and our own goose for the winter time and we had calves that we butchered you know we cut but a lot of them was our own calves that they would slot you know with kosher and and shabbos was all meats and then maybe one other time during the week maybe they i don't recall but mostly we ate vegetation you know fresh stuff that they made and cooked every day and, uh, and Saturday morning, of course, after we went to the mikvah, and then we went Friday, and Friday night, and then Saturday morning, of course, all day we went to shul. Come home, have lunch, and then after lunch we were able, we had no hater, we could go play. Sometimes we got into trouble playing, but we tried to play soccer, you're not supposed to, they said, but we did. And then you go to shul again in the afternoon. And then you come home and then after the Sabbath, you know, we have the, the end. It was, it was very nice. Shabbos was beautiful. And then Sunday morning, uh, we used to go to shul or no? We used to go to shul Sunday morning also. And then my father had, to, sometimes he left on Sunday and sometimes on Monday, mostly Sunday afternoon. Leave. So it was uh, nice. Do you remember singing any songs at this time? Well, we, I knew the prayers and the songs that we sang in the houses and the stuff, but I don't remember now. Uh, Depending different times, we would get together and sing in the house. I mean, uh, we sang after every meal. 
but those four songs that we sang together, you know, after the after the prayer, after you know, so she does it, did that. It's a nice song. Those days, I don't remember all of them, but the family shul I remember. When somebody starts, they part. You remember. You said they were cooking. Who was the, who cooked for the My grandmother family? mostly from in my house. And uh, and then of course for the children, there was a lot of neighbors came in, and and you had to seal it up in the oven, it cooked all night until Saturday. So they brought it to our house, I remember, other neighbors. And then they came Saturday, picked it up. Why did they specifically come to your house? I don't know, because uh, I guess my grandmother liked to do it, or she was good at it. So they bring their own pots, just put them in, and then they pick them up. But that was nice, uh, you know, the kugels, the children came out Saturday morning. That's what we ate Saturday. Every Saturday there was chulun and kugel, different kinds. And we ate that. What was your favorite food? I was, I gave them a hard time, you know, with eating. I was not exactly, behaved myself in those days. I was the oldest. I got away with a lot of stuff. But I remember that I liked everything that they made. But I didn't give them the satisfaction of telling you. But today I enjoy it, if I could get some of that food. Okay. There are not many people know how to prepare that today. But, uh, but it's good memories from the food. The kugels used to be with the kishkas inside. You know. and the winter time was, was probably the best time for the cooking because they stuffed the goose wasn't uh, us. We had a woman that worked in the house, like a nanny, whatever you wanted, their daughter to work. So they stuffed the goose, and then the shoyhut came, and then, and then they they made goose, and then the fat, and the gribbenness, and all that stuff. It didn't bother anybody. There was no cholesterol problem there. But we ate that. Even today, I like goose liver, pate. If I travel to Budapest, I always eat a lot of it there, even if it's cholesterol problem, it's good stuff. Can't get it here like there. Tell me about school. Well, school was interesting because you could attend two different schools. You could attend a Czech school or you could attend a Russian-Ukraine school. My father chose me to go to the Czech school. In the Czech school we were basically mostly Jews. And there was just one girl whose her sister was with me that went to the other school to Russia. And uh, so it was not a huge school room, but you went from from kindergarten on to till you till high school age, which I never reached. And then from high school, our, the Jewish kids would go to the Hebrew gymnasium, which was in Munkachevo. But I never, most of the older uh, relatives of mine, the ones that were older than I, who, when they graduated the gymnasium, or even halfway through, they spoke English. They were Hebrew, fluent, and, and it was a very good school to be. And even our school before we we went through to the... When I was a little older, I remember one thing, that they switched me to a different town, to a bigger school. And I was staying with some relatives during the week. And then, but it was like 14 kilometers from us. And I would bicycle. 14 kilometers. I bicycle to that town and come back from there. Sometimes I would do it on the same day, but mostly they didn't let me. They let me stay there and I would only come home for Shabbos. That was like a junior type of school, I don't know why. And then when 1938, when we were occupied by the Hungarians, 
सबसे थर्डी है a little later, 39 maybe, then they closed the Czech school. Then we all had to switch over to the Russian school. So I don't remember when I was going to Svadila. There was a teacher there. He liked me a lot. We had a Czech teacher who, when they closed the school, he had to run back to Czechoslovakia. And then I went to the Russian. It was still there, that school. I went to see it. Of course, the teacher died, and he was, he was an older guy. And uh, I remember that really clearly. Why do you remember it? I don't know. For some reason, he made an impression on me. That in those days, I was kosher, and he would always ask me to come in like we had like a break for lunch. And I would take my sandwich and I eat it. Whatever they gave me to eat, sandwich, I don't know how they called it then. So, and he would eat, uh, see in the winter time, when they kill the pigs, they eat the bacon, and it would always drip down. He said, you don't know how good this is, but I would need it. One day I changed the lunch with a boy, he had that bacon. I couldn't even look at it, eat I threw it away, I was afraid to eat it. I thought I was going to cheat and try it, because every time he had this knife and he cut it on a piece of dark bread, and I would just, and I see it running down it. I go, how good that would be if I could stand there with that knife and cut it. But I never tried. I never ate the bacon and that. And since today, to this day, I never tried it. That it was, it was just like pure fat. But somehow he had a, always had a good relationship with me. Even the Czech teacher was very close to me because when I was liberated, and I came to Prague. He, he was the first person that I knew that found me, that teacher. I don't remember his name today, but he found me when I came back from Buchenwald. And he, found, he, he evidently he looked to see who survived, and he found me there. That was a long time ago. So I really enjoyed school. We had to... Uh, one time we were hit by lightning at school. You know, we had the windows open and we had those tornadoes like you get here in the mountain. And i never forget that time. It came almost like through the window and out and it hit the tree, the lightning. It was a big fire in front of the school. We all ran out. It scared us. But we had, it was, it was, it was a school that really taught you well and educated you and uh, Masaryk was the president and he really made sure he would visit, he would come to little towns and visit schools to make sure that we get a proper education and uh, without publicity in the papers and stuff, just politically just make sure that we were well prepared, the country was just a young country it wasn't in business for too long Tape two, the date is August 11, 1996, the survivors Martin Greenfield. Let's pick up on um, your experience as a schoolboy and some of your memories after that particular storm. Well, you know, among, among my, I remember everybody in that school, of course, because from the oldest to the, to the young, because we, we, we you know, we used to go to the same synagogue and we used to play together, the older ones and the younger ones. Some of those people survived. Uh, I have a, a, my schoolmate, one of them is David Mermstein. He lives in Washington, D.C. He's very successful. He was the guy that went right back to study and, and became an accountant and, and his family lived there. In fact, the reason I know my father's birthday as well, because his stepbrother, who lived in Washington, was born on the same day with my dad. And when I came to this country, 
I found him. So I knew exactly there were three people that they were born in that little town the same day as my father. This man in Washington, who was a Mermustin, Sal Mermustin, and then my mother's brother, who was born before my mother, um, who immigrated before my mother was born, lived in Mexico City as a yanko that I became very close with at the end. He died also. He was born the same day as my father. They were all born November the 4th. So David and his sister Rivka and his sister Feige, we all went to the same school except David was my class and the others are older. And I see them from time to time. And there are some other people from my town who were older. He's 80 today, Barry Moscow, lived in my town, survivor. Still see him when I go to Washington, like in September. I'll be seeing him. I have in California some people from my town survive. Strangely enough, that we had quite a few people of my friends that survived. Some of my friends, of course, that survived from that school. And I was in the Aliyah in Germany. They went to Israel, you know, that I helped them get through my job to get to Israel. They were in the war, and they went to fight, and they died. After the camp. And I saw their graves. And Israel. So well, that was tough. So, but we were very close knit with uh, my kids. They were nothing but grand times we had because in my town, uh, next to it, we had famous mineral waters that are supplied all over. And and we used to go Saturday. We could visit. It was closed because they didn't work on Shabbos because of the it was owned by Jews. They wouldn't, they wouldn't work on Shabbos. So we used to go visit the bottling plant that's all natural. In fact, my son found some of Pavlovo water, which I have in my closet, that he was able to find at some place. He saw him sell it in a Russian store, and he bought me a couple of cases. And uh, the only people that like it, I guess, is me and my son, because it's got so much minerals in it that my wife would never drink it. She doesn't like minerals. I do. I was brought up on that one. We always had it in the house. So those were good memories. From there, of course, when the when it started, the problems. They, uh, the Hungarians, took stopped us from going to school after a while. That's when I went to Swaziland. They sent me away so I could continue school. How old were you? I must have been about 11 or so. So they were taking you to work uh, in like labor work, whatever. After a while, my father sent me to his, to his cousin in Budapest to hide me away, and I would only insist on going if he sent one of my older friends, Yitzchok, you know, and if he couldn't afford it to go, he had to pay for him, and we went together to Budapest to stay with my cousin. My cousin was my father's cousin, because I remember those girls used to vacation with us because we were in the mountains, so I guess it was the nicest places to go over occasion. They stayed with us and when we got there, they picked us up at the train station in Budapest. I couldn't speak Hungarian, not one word. We went to their house, but they had a beautiful apartment. It must have been well to do. And they put us in the kitchen to eat. My friend and him, and everybody sat in the dining room. So I said to my friend, tonight we're running away from here. Why? because we didn't eat in the dining room. When they come to us, they eat in the dining room. So I'm not staying here. My, my friend was older, he was crying. Where are we gonna, I don't know, we're gonna find a place. And we ran away at night. 
we found a place to stay, and later I found a job as a working as a grease monkey, you know, <coughs> in a gas station. And he found a job to go to work uh, uh, a cabinet maker. And we, you know, and I, I never wanted to tell my my parents that I was not happy there. So I wouldn't tell them that I wasn't happy. I said, I just wanted to go and get a job. I thought they needed something. So I figured if I work, I send them. Certain things were rationed in those days already. So in Hungary, you had more like sugar stuff. And I would send them a package from my work. Now that I realize now they didn't need that, but I, but I did. Where did you live? I, we found a place, I'm ashamed to say on the tape, but it was a whorehouse where we got an apartment because they gave us like a room there. And during the day, I never knew about, uh, you know, there were, must have been legal prostitution in Budapest because those girls were such a pretty girls and they were so nice. They send me for cigarettes and they give you a tip. They send you this, bring a tip. Then Sunday, they would take us to the beach. I guess they didn't work on Sunday. And we go swimming with them and stuff. And they were, they were the nicest people until I got into trouble and I broke my arm, you know, with driving or tried to drive a car or something. And I was in the hospital and I couldn't write to my father. The minute he got the letter that somebody else wrote, then he came looking for me. And he knew the address and he came there. When he came to see me, he brought my suitcase because he thought I lived in the wrong place. And then... I, uh, after that uh, fiasco, he took me back home, and, uh, and then the Germans, that was before Passover, 1944 that happened already. I was maybe, bar bar mitzvah never happened, because my father was taken away, and I waited for him to have my bar mitzvah. And then, by the time I was going to have the bar mitzvah, then we were taken to the concentration camp. So then I was, uh, I was already 14 years old. I never got to have the bar mitzvah. I, I read it, you know, but we didn't have nothing because I didn't, I didn't want to have it. My, my father was taken on the work camp. And then he got out of it, whatever. How long was he in the work camp? He was there for a while. Then he ran away to the partisans. He was with Tito's there in Yugoslavia. Then he just to, and then he got out of it. Because my father in his days, he was well respected in town, so the, even the Gentiles, they were just sort of on his side, so nobody bothered him. And then of course, before, when, he, when I came home, I was still in cast, you know, my arm and stuff, whatever. And then he, he knew that they were gonna, they were taking Jews in the other town. so. He, so my godfather has had two daughters in that little town next to us. There were only three Jews, and they decided they're going to not go to the Germans. They're going to run into the woods, and they're going to... And my father wanted me to go with them, as clearly as I see today. Packed me up, gave me one of his guns, because, you know, in those days you used handguns. Because my father traveled with payrolls and stuff. So there was always handguns that he owned gave me one of the handguns. In fact, he took me out to try to practice with me how to use it. And I said, I'm not going. I'm not going unless we go together. I'm not, there's no way I'm going. And as it happened, not because of my wisdom, there was one man in the town that we lived in who was very anti-Semitic, and he looked for those people all the time. And just before, the Russians came to reoccupy the town after the war. He found them two weeks before. It was a giveaway. One of the boys would have connections with some other Gentile people for food. And he was careless. He didn't watch who follows him. And he followed them. He took the, the Gestapo, whoever it was, and, and this fellow Lipsick, who lives in Washington, he came back before he was liberated like 
in, 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 in January, one of the concentration camps in Auschwitz. He was left behind for dead, but he was liberated. He came to town, and they were still laid out. All the bodies were laid out in front of his big house on the ground and shot. Everybody was dead, and he buried them, the slipsy. So I, 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 I don't know if I was there, maybe I wouldn't have been careless like the other guy, but uh, I didn't run away. So then we were taken to the, to the, to Munkarchevo. We walked. What year was this? 1944, right after Passover, say about March, April. I'd like to backtrack a little bit to the, uh, to 1938, 39, mm -hmm. and. Um, when you were in Budapest and sort of move a little backwards first before we move into 1944. When, when I was in Budapest, so already the Jews had to wear armbands, you know, with the stars. But since I lived there, and since I worked for a nice Gentile man, I never bothered with that stuff. I was like completely not visible there in Budapest because I didn't have no food stamps if you wanted meat and stuff and I, I just did without it, it didn't bother me. You used to go in and, and buy something, uh, so you, in a restaurant, you know, they made, hung, hungry always cook good, so you eat vegetables, I was used to that anyway. I never ate meat because I didn't have that ticket to get in a restaurant. Meat, you had to give a coupon. You were working for this auto mechanic shop at the yeah. time? And then whatever I got paid, I supported myself. Although my father gave me money, but I wouldn't touch that money. Because I felt maybe they need it. I was just brought up that you need to watch for your family, not to spend the money. And I, I just, whatever he paid me, that's what I lived on. And plus, but the, the, these girls used to give me plenty of tips. So <laughs> I had plenty of money, and they gave me food, whatever I wanted. They, they really took care of me. How long did you live there? I lived there from when, maybe it was C39. The 40s, 41, you know, it got very tough there. So that's where you're talking about the 30s, the 30s, late 39s or 40, when we were really occupied. I don't remember when we had, because we were so far away in the, in the country where we didn't feel the pressure, even if the regime changed. It did not hit us because we were, it's too much of a problem for them to come and cover every little town and everything. So I'm not clear on the years where we really got it bad. We didn't wear no armbands where we lived because we were a small town and nobody was, was governing us. So there were no police people there that looked out like in a big city where they had these rules and regulations. In Budapest, you were there about how long? I was there about a year and a half or so. I don't Could have been longer, but I don't remember that, the, the length of it. Because I learned, I was fluent in, in, in Hungarian. I started reading and writing and I didn't even go to Hungarian school. If I did, I don't remember. And your age was what at that time? Well, you have to. When I, when I finished Budapest, was 19, say, 43, 44, the beginning. So from 28 to 44 is what? 16. 16? Couldn't be 16. Yeah, 16. See, I'm not clear on that. 1928. You were in the table, yeah. No. See, I must have been there two years or two and a half years. I was hidden in between my father was away. Trying to remember the 40, 41, 42. That was the time when I was supposed to be about mitzvah and I couldn't be. And then my father was away. And 
after my father got out. So it must have been a span of about two, three years. That's right. And what made you go back from, to, from Budapest to Pavlova? No, my father took me back because he found me that I was in the hospital. So he took me back home. So I remember my younger brother, how he was, because I was away and I hardly knew him. He was hanging around me like I was the hero, you know. He was only five years old. So I remember that vividly. And then we, so in between, that was the era of, uh, I didn't, I lost touch with home a lot because I was away. So I was sort of happy to go home. It was a short stay though. And then they took us. They took us to whatever they came in. When they surrounded the house, the Germans and the Hungarians, they gave us time to pack up and out of the house. How long were you home before this occurred? Two days. And, uh, and who was they? Who came to your house? The Germans, Gestapo, and the Hungarian, they had their own police, whatever they called them. Sabachapato, they called them like the Hungarian Gestapo. They were called Sabachapo in Hungarian. I don't know what it means. Did they knock on your door? They knocked on the door. The house was surrounded. And they said we should pack up everything, whatever we could carry, and we should be out within an hour, whatever. Packed that. But we knew already that they were going to come. Of course, my father knew already from the next town, I don't know how, that he knew. Either somebody went by, by motorbike or something to, to see the town, that they had the Jews outside, and then this bigger town next to us, Polina. So they came back, they said the Jews are outside, so they started packing already, the family. Because they were putting jewelry and, you know, I remember they were winding the, the, the uh, you know, the yarn over, because they did a lot of knitting there and stuff, over their jewelries and the monies and the stuff, and they were hiding this, putting this under the ground, putting there, whatever, to prepare and what to pack and what to take and what not to take, precious, not precious, pictures, that stuff that they wanted to save, memorabilia. And uh, so we were out. How, do you remember your reaction while all of this was going on? It was, uh, we were scared. We were, uh, leave your home, where we going? What is going to happen to us? We have, my grandmother was older, my, the baby was five years old, my sisters, my mother, and then I had my other family. My father's father, the grandfather, was very close to me, Abruham. He was, oh, because he trained horses, I always hung out with him a lot. And we would go sleigh riding, you know, we do everything together with my other grandfather. My one grandfather was dead. So in shul, I would always sit next to my father and grandfather. And it was, so he was, so of course we tried to stick together, the whole town, the people, but we walked. And walked, and they surrounded us, and they made us walk with the kids, carrying everything. I carried everything, and we carried our brother from time to time. And we had to get to to Munkachevo, which was not so close. And then they took put us into a brick factory barracks, where we stayed together, our family. My father was well known all over, even Mukachevo, so they let him go out from the camp to go in, and he would bring us stuff, so we would have extra. Not everybody was allowed to. But he was like the leader of the town, so they let him, even the Gestapo, 
to let him out and in out of he could have run away my father but he didn't because he didn't want to leave us alone then my grandfather Abraham was such a strong man they, they were cutting everybody's beards out the Germans and he wouldn't let them and as vividly as I'm sitting facing you he knocked three Gestapo dies down on there they wouldn't let him and they finally got a hold of them they hit him and they cut his beard out it like we thought that the strength of his was the beard but uh, he was devastated what they did to my grandfather because they cut his beard out I mean you can't believe how devastating that is to a person who lived all his life for somebody to come do you care about my beard you want to take me or don't take me but they did those things to, to, to everybody I mean some people didn't care but he cared but they did it anyway and then of course we were in that I can't even tell you how long we were in in that camp it was a long time maybe a month or longer and, and because of my father's uh, whatever he was doing there they left us to the end and we were the last transport and I remember that trip as vivid as I could do when they put us in the box cars and they and we, we, we were in and we tried to stick together like our town people whoever was left behind and my father was always in charge of everything because you didn't have no bathrooms to go to everything has to be there and and it wasn't exactly the right aroma you know when you were in those box cars but we survived the trip and we came to Auschwitz that was like open the cars that's the only time they open the cars and out right away and then I saw the prisoners because the prisoners come to greet you and they're, uh, and they're playing with violins you know they had a band and then we come up but they push you and they, even the prisoners they push you, push you out fast, fast, fast and we go in to face this Mengele which I didn't know then we're going and I remember that he wanted my mother to go to the right with us women to the right men to the right left and my mother carried my brother and my sister she had by her hand and they took my older sister Sima to the right and my mother and my grandmother my grandfather well, my mother wouldn't leave the kids and they went to the left which I didn't know then, I'll be honest with you, what, where, why they were going, where they were going, because they said, we'll see them later. Because I wanted to, I called that to my mother, I'll see you later, see you later, my father said, see you later. And then they took us, and the only thing I know is, as we walked with our packages, we had to leave the packages, and, and dress stark naked, and then they shaved you all over, and they put you in the next room and they disinfect you because it was burning as hell under my arms and every place where they shave you and then they give you this uniform and you had to leave everything behind so no matter what was hidden in the shoes my father had it or whatever he had it was gone and then we went to the next room I was still with my father together I hung on on him with my dear life and then we, they, gave, they took away, even our shoes they took away. They gave us that, you know, like slip and something, which I couldn't even walk in. And uh, then we went, before we could put the uniform on, then they tattooed our arms. I was sitting there and tattooed numbers, and they put the numbers from then on, you were that number. They made a list of your numbers. And then, so the first night, I don't even remember. And the next day, they called on appeal. They called everybody together, and then they asked for volunteers, tradesmen. They asked for this, they asked for that. And my father, when they asked automobile mechanic, my father volunteered my number. Immediately, I says, how could you? 
that's my father always talked to me about survival, about whatever happens to us before and there, about during the train trip, that if whatever we do, we should always believe that we should be going to survive this year and we're going to find each other and we look for each other, but we should not be together. If we have to work or we have to be in a camp, we should be separated. We'll be stronger that way. We have more chance. We don't suffer together. We don't. So that's what he tried to do, to separate us. And they did. I ran out. I, was, I didn't want to go. And they, they step up, send the dogs after you. That's when I was bitten by one of the shepherds. I still have a mark on my leg. And uh, I was upset with my dad for a few minutes. But then I realized that if I was with him because I saw fathers and sons and brothers, then they, none of them survive. Because everything, anything happens to one, happens to the other. Because you suffer double. Then I realized how smart my father was and how he prepared me for this survival. He says, we have to survive. We are going to survive. And we did. Some of us did, some of us didn't. He didn't. So, uh, and then I was taken away from there. Before we uh, go to the next location, could you uh, just tell me how old you were? I assume I was 16, you tell me. I thought I was younger. Because I don't remember some of my youth. I didn't live, you know, so I... But if I go by the numbers, 44, I must have... 15 I was, because I would have been... In August, I would have been 16. So I knew that I had these two years that I was hiding around, that he sent me away from, and why I didn't have my bar mitzvah. So I was 15. And then, then I got to be 16 in concentration camp. I was liberated when I was 16. What kind of uh, food did you eat in Auschwitz? In Auschwitz, they gave you one, one meal. They gave you, in the, in the morning, like a, some, that's made like a coffee or something. It's not real coffee, you know, that they make from something black. And then they gave you one piece of bread, of, that they called bread, which wasn't even remote black. It was made from something. It was black. But that's what we ate in the morning. We got in at night. When you come back from work, you had the soup that they gave you, one, some, some that resembled something. What kind of work did you do? Well, that's what, in the beginning, in the beginning, I was cleaning up in Birkenau, in Auschwitz, you know, that was the camp where they gassed people. There I, they put me to work in a clean-up kind of situation. And then... Uh, what does that mean? It means, like, you know, they had some of those clothes and some of the items that we had to clean up. And we, Okay, you are rushing too fast. You're, well, you're I was sit, doing. Want to sit up? I'm fine. Okay. Okay. Tape three, August eleventh, nineteen ninety-six. The survivor is Martin Greenfield. I'd like to pick up on the job that you did in Auschwitz. See, if I recall, the the exact job in the beginning was like picking up a lot of clothes and separating shoes and separating everything, even finding stuff that they watched us to make sure that we put everything in different piles. That was my first job. And that evidently was from the new prisoners that they brought in. That was Birkenau was the place. Birkenau was the gas chambers where they were. We did not go into the gas chambers. We did not unclothe the people. What they did is take us into that area, evidently before they took the people into the gas chamber where they gassed them, and they had to leave everything there, and there is where we did all the separation. 
of clothing and piles, and that was my first job. How many people were there with you? On this job? Like we had groups of working people. It must have been 40, 50 people <clears throat> because there was a lot of work to do to, to separate the, the way they wanted everything done in a certain way. Do you know why they, you were receiving these clothes? We weren't receiving it. We were picking up the prisoners' clothes. And that, what they did with them, the Germans, I don't know whether they, they, they washed them. And I think they washed everything. And what they did with the civilian clothes, I don't know. Did you know where the, uh, what happened to the people whose clothes they were while you were doing this? I did this? not know that time that they were not alive anymore. Because evidently it could have been that we worked on the same clothes that somebody else did the work before I arrived, you know, that they picked up our clothes. And uh, I did not do, I know something that somebody would take something and try to steal something, and he got beaten to a pulp because somebody saw him do that. And it wasn't exactly that the Gestapo saw him do it. It was one of the couples that was in charge of, you know, they was a prisoner, whatever kind he was, political otherwise. So I remember that very vividly. And during that time, if I remember correctly, they were picking out people from our, the new prisoners, and they had like a political area where they took you there to interrogate you. And I was one of them. And they asked me where my father was. I said, my father's in concentration camp. I don't know where he was. I don't know where he is. I didn't want to give him the number. I knew it, because my father's number was one before mine. But I wouldn't give them because I was afraid they're going to hurt my father. So then they wanted to know whether my father was ever a partisan. I said my father was never a partisan. Then they started to whip you, lashes. Then they had the first time I ever was whipped by another prisoner because they said to this other person, whoever, I don't remember this person, that he should hit me. As hard as he could, otherwise they're going to hit him hard. So he whipped me. Then they asked me to whip him because he, he hit me. And I remember those things. I know one time I didn't say anything. This happened one, two, three, four, five days in a row. And I came in to, to my barrack. And there was the guy who was in charge, a couple of some kind, a German, I think. And he saw that the skin was coming off my back. Actually, literally, it was raw flesh, but I wouldn't say nothing, complain. I figured that if, if I last, I last. I wouldn't say nothing about my father. I didn't know enough, you know, that they say that they just picked people. And this man said, tomorrow there's a transport going to Buna. Your number is on it, and you'll be out of here. Never asked me questions. And that man saved my life. And Why do you think he did it? I don't know. I never saw him again. And, and I was on that transport to Buna. When I came to Buna, I never complained to anybody about my back or I didn't say anything. And then they put me in to teach me how to be a bricklayer. And I went to bricklayer school. And they, a short time, they made me into a bricklayer. And I was building and laying bricks. And what happened or something that I had a hit, something happened to my leg, or was it that the, my back never healed up the, the infection because phlegmona said in some place. And I went to the hospital. I figured, look, if I die, I die. And that hospital was a, a man who was there, a doctor. I don't remember his name, strangely enough, but he was a, my father. He knew my father. And he said to me that he's going to take me out of this because the cement and the, the way they made us work. Uh, and he's going to make me work in the hospital. And that was, I was like, he really saved my life, mostly. 
in between. Or while I worked in the hospital, when I remember that I became a laundryman for the Gestapo, where I washed his clothes, and they, you know, I never knew how to wash. And with a with a brush they gave me and soap, and it ripped his collar. And he gave me that. First he whipped me, and then he gave me the shirt, because he said he couldn't use it; it was ripped. And that shirt was like most prized possession, because I used it. They thought I was somebody. It started with me tr tr getting dressed, you know about. It. And then I continued to this job. I ripped a couple others then. I was smart enough to do that. Then I had already a wardrobe, two, three shirts. Everybody thought I was somebody. Because you only had a jacket, a prison jacket in the fence. I was under the prison jacket, I had a shirt like this. It looked like a Gestapo shirt or in, something. In addition to your um, hospital duties, then you were doing laundry. I was doing laundry, and I, well, I helped a lot of people because I could go into any barrack, nobody ever stopped me. And in the hospital, we saved a lot of people because this doctor, when there was somebody who was very skinny, every in the hospital every week there was inspection. They called them the Muslim man inspection. The Muslim man was a person that was wasting away, so I could stand in to see when we wanted to save somebody. And they called the number. It was me. I mean, and some of the doctors already there among the Gestapo. Some of them had a little sensitivity, you know, that I think they knew that I was standing in, and they just let it go. Because after we built that person up, there was not too much food or something, but with rest and something, where he could go back on his job. This, so without having to go into the, the... A lot of them died anyway, I'll be honest with you, because people was very weak, a lot of them. Once you were, they were in the hospital, not many got out to, 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 to survive. Some of them did. I had, I know I saved the shoichet from my town, the guy who was c coming to cut. I saved him. He was from my town. In fact, he, he got liberated in the beginning because when they took us, I left him in the hospital with food in a corner hidden. The Germans never had a chance to clear out those people, and he was liberated in January. And I was still in concentration until April. So he made me into a big hero, which I wasn't. I just helped. There were a couple of other people that I helped. That when I came back, I had the reputation that I did. I was just a kid trying to give somebody it didn't mean nothing. What I did was nothing. But evidently saved his life. So to him it was a lot. Did you have enough food to eat during this time? Well, in the hospital, since I was given out that soup, whatever it was, not only was I giving it out, when I had the shirt I could go in, I took it to some of that's the hero ship that I, whatever was a little left over, I would take it to, or they came over to me, or I take it to their barracks when they come home from work. Those were the people that I knew from my area. And when they survived, they always talked at how much I help them survive. But I didn't help them survive. It was just something you do instinctly, like home. I mean, God helped them survive. I didn't have believe me, sure it was there because it was locked that they didn't find them or something. I hid them. But they didn't. If I knew that I could hide with them, wouldn't I stay there and try and, and, and be liberated in January? But I I had to do uh, but I you do what you do. In between those were the, the jobs that I remember. If I did other things in between, it's not that I'm rushing to say that I want to do less. I have so much horror built in between Birkenau and Auschwitz in my head that comes back to me in the big early days that was just, you know, with our sleeping in the barracks and how do you go to the bathroom and how do you uh, move and you're ten people in one area, when do you turn? Does everybody turn at the same time? And some of them, they save that little piece of black bread. They figure they're going to live longer if they, and somebody tries to steal it from them. There are many things that I remember about it. But it's, uh, I remember being beaten up uh, 
for some silly things that I I worked. Uh, and see, one time I had my hands cut off in the camp here, the fingers, because how did I get in to work on in a, in a place for for when they needed somebody? Maybe they took me from the hospital. I don't remember. And I worked uh, among the Polish people, you know, because Auschwitz was near there. And then uh, I was supposed to, uh, uh, you know, feed the machine to, to cut boards. And then the guy did something to one of my friends there, and I just turned because, and I almost lost my whole hand. See, all these things were cut. But so many other things happen. And then sometimes we went out, they took us on a field trip to, 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 for whatever. And you get lucky, you know, uh, you see something growing, a potato or something. Mm -hmm. And those were not Gestapo people, the guards, maybe they didn't have enough. And they just let us pick it up. The Gestapo would never let you pick up. So I was good. Sometimes one of the soldiers gave me a piece of uh, worst, you know, to eat. I mean, that's rare, but it happened that you found somebody who was nice to you. And I remember those days. And then that was more or less my stay in that area in the Buna until... Where, in relationship to Ashes, where was Buna? Buna was in that area in Poland. Buna was a plant that the Germans created to, to create... Uh, from coal, you know, energy and gasoline. In fact, they already had created in that factory that they made margarine out of synthetic, you know, from there, because I knew that that we were doing. I worked in that factory. And the only thing they never accomplished is because at the end, I used to see the trucks, the German trucks, one truck pulled three trucks because they didn't have enough gasoline. So they tried to have the... the, the you know, made some energy out of it. And then you saw some trucks that they were, actually they, they created the gas trucks from wood, you know, wood alcohol that they were burning in the back and they were driving the engines. So they needed some, some sort of uh, gasoline that they didn't have enough because I understand. Now I know that the Americans bombed uh, Yugoslavia, not Yugoslavia, in Romania where they had a lot of the oil fields that the Germans were getting and some of the other oil fields maybe that they bombed out. So they, I worked in that plant, but every time that the plant was almost finished, uh, they, they bombed the place, the Americans. They knew exactly everything. So they must have had spies. They never came to help us, but they knew everything. And they would not let us go in a shelter, the prisoners. So we would go into a pipe or something, and then you get bombed, and you hear the bombs, you, f you think it's falling on your head. But the only time the shrapnels hit you, and, and I can't tell you how many of people I saw hit with shrapnels, is when you don't hear the bomb. That's when it really comes, when it whistles, then it goes someplace else. You learn that later. Because when it goes on top of you is when you don't hear it, is when it's dangerous. What but I never say, got here. Tell us about your job at Buna. I don't remember what I did in that factory. Maybe in the beginning, I was the bricklayer there. And I think that's what I did there. I built the, 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 the buildings, you know, because they bombed them and I fixed them. Because I remember working on that on a building where it was a holiday. It was in the fall. It could have been Rosh Hashunah or something because we did not have calendars. But we remember the holiday through somebody. And whatever we were doing or whatever we remember to sing or something, with this guy we were doing the bricks. And all of a sudden he wasn't there. And that was the first time when I saw somebody target practice on a human being. One of the Gestapo just shot him from the bottom and he was just fell off. And I kept on working. There was no fear in me that I was going to get shot or die. I never had fear of anything. I could tell you if there was either stupidity or dumbness, but I was never afraid. 
And that was also credited to my father because I was not afraid of the dog. I was not afraid of dead people because before uh, I saw people die, I helped pe bury people in my hometown because there were no men around. So I really never, I always was trained that the person is dead, he's dead. That's it. And, and when I had to pick up bodies in, 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 in a concentration camp or somebody died in the hospital, I just, it was just a job to do. You do it and, and, and you go on next. Me, I could do anything. I was never afraid. I figured if the guy's going to shoot me, he's going to shoot me. So what am I going to do? I can't stop him because I have no defense mechanism. I wouldn't do something crazy to go and get myself killed. But I, I, I stayed within the rules, and I did those things until see. In the hospital, my job was much easier. I could help a lot of people. I was, you know, better kind of jobs to do. It was exactly you deal with sick people. It's not always. Maybe some people couldn't do that, but for me, it was good. And that was to the end till we were taken away because the Russians were closing in on Auschwitz. Then the Germans were taking us out. What time of year was this? That was exactly in January. The coldest winter I ever remember. That we marched out. Not only us, there were about 20 some thousand people that marched. And there weren't many survivors. And my group I don't remember the number of my group. I only know that we survived only 500 of us survived this march that I know of. Of how many? Of, see, totally, my group could have been 12,000, it could have been 10,000, it could have been, but almost everybody got shot there because we just couldn't make it. See, there was nobody had shoes proper and everybody had to walk, you know, until Glybis there was no transportation. Everything was bombed out, so that you walked. <coughs> you went from Buma to Glybis? Yeah. By and March. Was... And as soon as a person fell down, he got shot. There was no, not even remote possibility that they would say, try and help him. There was no way. And the bitter cold was like the temperatures could have been, where I grew up, we had temperatures below 30s and stuff. So we, you know, my body was adjusted to cold weather, but this was unbelievable. For me, I had dressed, I was able to have socks because I fixed up in the hospital stuff because we walked together with the doctors. So they were the Gestapo doctors and they were the regular doctors and we had a wagon that's supposed to have medications, whatever, but that Medication we never used on anybody because they never let you use on anybody. They just we just pushed that wagon, so we had some supplies. Until we couldn't do it no more, then we just dropped the wagon, and then we carried. And then I remember the Gestapo made me carry his pack, not the doctors, another the guards. And that's what saved my life and a few of us, because we ate his food. And then, in the morning when he looked for me, they buried me under the snow. And then they were taking new guards over. We took all his, they, all the Gestapo we found out then, they had vitamins they gave him, those pills to take. We took those pills, I don't know how many we took. And, and, and we ate up every piece of food and we, took, we threw away his ammunition. Could you I did that. Could you explain what do you mean by being buried under the snow? Buried under the snow is for him not to find me. It was huge snows outside. So he was looking for me and they had to hide me away. They covered me with the snow. Who was they? You know, the people that I shared the food with, that we were still left there with them. And it was already in Clivids we arrived. When that happened, you know, when we finished his food, it was almost glided by the station. And then they pushed me in the snow, covered the snow up, and he looked. He thought, huh, maybe I dropped dead, somebody shot me. And then he left. They changed guards. But thank God that I was saved. 
Oh, the doctors in the hospital and you walked on this march together mm -hmm. originally. Oh, yes. They survived the doctors. I don't know if they survived where they are now, whether they survived after, because not everybody from there went to Buchenwald, Mauthausen, or any other camp. I happened to be from Gleiwitz, but you could hear the Russian guns all along while we were marching. You could hear the fight going on. And you were just hoping that they were going to come and liberate you, but they didn't. So when we were in Gleiwitz, the Russians were just in back of us. Every time we got there, I bet they were faster than we were marching. How many days did this march take? I knew you were going to ask that, but see, I don't remember the days. I don't remember the days when I got to Buchenwald. I don't remember the days, how many days it took. I remember only the highlights, the highlights of Gleiwitz, the highlights of me surviving under the snow, the highlights of me eating that food that the Gestapo had. I remember, uh, I don't remember the, uh, the person got shot, he got shot, what was I going to do? I did not reflect on that, I was afraid that I was going to be next to get shot. I knew I wasn't going to drop, and I knew I was, if I had no shoes, I'd walk with frozen feet. I wasn't going to get shot. That's all I remember. And when I got to Gleiwitz, I remember distinctly that I was healthy, because I was the one who was given out, because as we got to Gleiwitz, and we got into this barrack where the German officers were, and they had to leave, they evacuated them. They left the kitchen full with food as much as I never saw in my life. And we gave out, I was cutting the food to give out to the prisoners before they packed us in to take us on unopened cars to go to different concentration camps. I didn't know where I was going. And the next thing I knew, I wound up in, in Buchenwald. Why did the Germans allow you to go into that kitchen to eat? Do you mean the Germans? In Gleiwitz, when you went into this the is, kitchen. This is, you know, the people that took us, those guards, they were gone, they were new guards, and that was the only food we ever had, you know, from this whole march, so they let us, I guess, eat that food, and I was given out rations. They tell you how much to give, cut, whatever. There were a few of us capable, maybe the doctor next to me, but we were able to, to, to deal with that. And they stood over you that you should give rations to everybody, otherwise they would have all died. So I guess they wanted to have survivors, the, 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 the Germans, to continue the work, whatever. And then when we finished that, there was somebody I met who I gave food to in Gleiwitz, and I gave him a double portion that he survived and he talked about it at our gathering. That did I remember? I didn't remember. He remembered. He was older. He remembered that I was the one that gave him the, the food in, in, in libraries. There are very difficult to remember every part. Sometimes I go back, I remember something, and sometimes you try to forget it. In the beginning, I remembered everything and I tried to forget everything because you want to sleep at night instead of having nightmares. But I, uh, I remember only, you, you think that I run through things. The reason I'm running through things is for one reason. While I remember, so I shouldn't forget them, later you'll ask me, I wouldn't remember it, I'll tell you the truth. Because when you remember is when you go through things. Because it's not easy, I'm 50 years, it's, it happened, I was liberated in 45, and you know it's 96, it's 51 years now. It's going to be, or whatever. It's 50 years, it's not the only thing I did was think about the concentration camp. My father taught me one thing. If you're going to live, live a normal life. If you're not going to live, you're better off dying. Because to honor us who died, you should live like a normal life. And I did that. I came to America. And I don't want to talk about it now, because I know you think I'm going to rush you. But this is what I mean about not remembering. I tried to be, when I came to this country 18 and a half or whatever I was, I wanted to live like any other human being. So I tried to forget as much as I can. It's different. When you got to Gleibitz, did you know what had happened at that point to your family? 
I didn't know anything while I was in concentration camp. I kept on looking every place. I saw a transport or I saw women. I looked for somebody. I had an inkling to know that there was a crematorium since I picked up. I was there. I was not a total idiot. But then you see the searchers here of the plane crash now. Why are they searching for those bodies? Until you see it. Until you see, they say, this is the body died. You cannot believe that these people are dead. I never saw my people die. So they say crematorium. But I don't see my mother die and see my brother die, sister die. So I always look for them. I want to find them. Especially my father, who I knew was alive, and my other sister who went the other way, which I know. I definitely look for them at least of all. But in my head, I still believe that maybe by some miracle, they didn't guess. They ran out of gas. Maybe they didn't do it. Maybe they're still alive. So to this day, I, I dream about them alive. Because I never saw them die. I know my grandfather died, my other grandmother died. I saw them die. But I didn't see them until Somebody came and said to me, I was with your father. He was shot. And if I tell you why my father was shot, that man told me I was not there. My father they had this profession of building. And that bridge was supposed to be built, you know, whatever they needed, the Germans. And of course the people, because his people, he was this group that worked that he was in charge of, they ran out of strength. They couldn't do it. So guess who was responsible? My father was shot for not having that job finished. Right at the firing squad. And that was only about three weeks before I was liberated. So, uh, and that was eyewitness person told me, stop looking. Because you're not going to find them. I saw him die, your father. I saw him get shot. So that's how I, I know my sister. Nobody ever told me how my sister died in concentration camp. Whether they took her as an experimental person, you know, in Auschwitz, or whether they did whatever with her. She was brown, blue-eyed, and they took some of those brown, blue-eyed kids to whatever. But I never found out. Because I never found anybody that knew. And uh, this is this is where the Auschwitz era and up to Gleiwitz and up to Buchenwald. But Buchenwald was another story that was really a part of. Uh, as I got older and I got the concentration camp longer then you remember a little bit more because it's, it's, it's more vivid to you. Okay. See, I'm not rushing. Much better. August 11th, 1996, tape four. The survivor is Martin Greenfield. Let's pick up on um, how you got to, from Gleiwitz to Buchenwald. Well, from Gleiwitz to Buchenwald, we traveled in open cars, cattle open cars. The weather was still horrendously cold, and many people died in the cars. They were frozen to death. They didn't have that warm clothing. They didn't give us any of that warm clothing. What did you have on? I don't even recall, but it must have been something extra with the shirts that I had to remember gotten from the Gestapo that maybe had one, two, three on top of it, layers and whatever. I know that I was cold, and I know because of the doctors that I was with in the Gestapo, they let us build a little fire in the open car because they wanted to keep warm, and that kept me warm also. But in between, our job was also to throw, the minute anybody died, we just had to get rid of the body and we threw them out of the cattle car. So I don't know how many, but many people died frozen. 
and I don't remember how long the, the trip took. But when you arrived in Buchenwald, Buchenwald is near Weimar. There was a camp that held maybe over 50,000 prisoners easily. I knew the exact amount, I just don't recall it today. I'm sure some places it's written in the history how many. I know that they had 12,000 Russian soldiers and a lot of pilots, prisoners in Buchenwald. I know that they had, the barracks were like separated, Jews separate, and, and uh, uh, in fact there were a lot of Czechs also in Buchenwald, because I know later, uh, I'll tell you about that later, why I know there were so many different uh, items. When I got into Buchenwald, it was a huge, Camp, really big, and it was built, beautiful barracks they had, and, and they had, to, it was like on a hill, and, uh, and the Germans built themselves beautiful areas, and that was when they did the lampshades, you know, from people, that was Buchenwald, uh, was that, uh, that, see, I don't remember the lady's name, I could tell it to you a thousand times, this woman, uh, she was married to one of these doctors that they tattooed the bodies and then they made lampshades out of uh, human beings. But I, my job was to work in a, in, a, in a munition factory. I remember that because during the night somebody whispered to bring something back, whatever, that we could sneak in some part of a weapon or something. I don't know what it's, a screw or this and then somebody would take it, but I never knew who talked to me, I never knew who took it. I never knew why it was done, but then I found out uh, later that uh, it was an underground something, they tried to liberate the camp, uh, and it was directed, from, which I found out later through somebody, through a Russian, one of the Russian officers, who had no legs actually, a pilot or whatever he was, in the camp, and he was the first, he was the guy, the brains behind it. And I found out that he was maybe even Jewish that night, who was directing that. And so I remember working, and that was my, from the whole time that I was in Buchenwald, that is the place where I worked most of the time. I don't remember any other. Uh, Oh yes, and then they 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 took me for a while. When the Americans started bombing Weimar, the city, they took me to clean up. You know, after the bombs, they took us. Uh, there was another. Uh, lots of things were in Buchenwald, which I found out after the liberation. That they they had a commando that built. Uh, underground facilities to hide all the diamonds and all the stuff that were taken from all the Jews that was hidden there near Buchenwald and those people were all killed that they shouldn't talk about what was there because I remember after the liberation before the they took me back you know after the liberation that they were digging up the Americans that stuff with the diamonds where I could have worked in there and I could have maybe gotten rich, but I didn't. Somebody gave me a watch at Schaffhausen from that thing that threw it up to me while I was watching them dig. And to this day, I believe that the American government has got all those diamonds and stuff, trucks and trucks for days were taken from there, and I don't think they ever gave it back to anybody. Can we backtrack when, uh, for a moment when you said that um, the barracks in Buchenwald were, were really nice, beautiful? Compared to Auschwitz, I mean... Would you describe the difference for us? Well, I think that they were... Uh, um, I mean, we still had the same conditions inside. But from the outside, when I arrived in Kent, it made an impression to me that it was such a huge camp together although they had a crematorium there as well. 
that they burned people, but it was a very impressive looking area. You know, they had this big flag, the German in the middle of it. Of course, when you came to Auschwitz, you also had the gate, the uh, Arbeit macht das Leben frei, you know, that they give you all this stuff. But they, that was a huge, huge camp. And, and, and it, it, it was, must have been a, a sunny day in cold weather whenever we arrived, and it just looked different from all the camps, you know, that I had been in, because it was so big and it was built up, so when they had, but of course the guards were up tall on the, you know, we had all those wires around there, and it was, and it was on the top of a hill, it was, it was impressive to me that time, you know, that, that camp. What do the barracks look like inside? Inside, of course, all the barracks that we slept was about ten people together, no mattresses, you know, just on the wooden uh, planks. And uh, I think that was about the same every place, wherever I, I, I was. Did you have blankets? I'm just trying to think myself now when you asked me that question whether we had blankets. We must have had something to cover ourselves with. But it was one or two, I don't recall. But I think we did have something to cover ourselves with. Because I know we had to make the bed. Bed, I mean, we had to straighten something out. And if you didn't do it straight, I know you got whipped, so I had to be a blanket. Something, I remember, part of that. Well, what happened in Buchenwald was no great shake to me that anything happened that I that I have big memories of other than before see it started in March that they started taking everybody away from home. First people came in, lots of people were there. They wouldn't let us near them, but they were always surrounded. That means they came from other camps or they stayed over and then they started taking people out of Buchenwald. That made us know that something is happening, that the Germans are, are in trouble. So they took all the Russians out. Together lined up, they were all in Russian uniforms. The Russian soldiers did not wear any, like we wore, the stripes. They stayed with the uniforms and they did not take them to work out. They just kept them in camp. But they took them all out and they marched them out from the camps. And then from then they took the Jewish barracks. So how did I not march out? That's when I found out there was a Czech barrack. And they took me, they let me hide there as a Jew. Who let you hide there? You know, the, 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 the prisoners that I mixed in with them. <laughs> and that's how I did not get transport out of there. Because when we were liberated, and I was part of the liberation team anyway, to take off the, the soldiers, that's how this man operated, because we already saw the Americans and heard the guns far away. Down. We were on a hill, and on the bottom you could see that they were fighting, the Germans were fighting the Americans. But they didn't come. So that night, somebody came to you and then you had to go to some place where they had a machine gun already and took off. Took off the guard, didn't shoot him. Came down with his hands up, tied him up, and took over the whole camp. These people, not me, I wasn't the genius. I was just a little tool with them. And then they, I remember that they said that somebody's going to burn down the camp and the Germans are going to come, but they're not going to, they never got there. And the next day, that was April 10th, April the 11th, 1945, the Americans marched into our camp in the morning. Where were you? I was uh, guarding the, <laughs> the people that I think I was there. I don't remember. I was no longer in the barracks. We were already out. There was nobody, there was no Gestapo around us. We were already, basically, a lot of people didn't know. They didn't want them to know to get... Uh, because we were afraid they were going to come. We wanted them, they wanted them to stay in the barracks. 
but we were liberated, except we didn't know what was going to happen. And the Americans came in from every side. The Gestapo started changing into uniforms of ours, shooting the prisoners and putting their uniforms on because they were hiding away. They didn't want to be caught as prisoners. <clears throat> it was bedlam in there. We had guns. We had everything we wanted because it was already... Americans came in. <sighs> Eisenhower didn't come right away. I didn't know about Eisenhower or anything like that. The Americans came in and we were the youngest group, like Ellie Wiesel and myself. And the, the, we were the Where did 15, you meet Ellie Wiesel? Well, he was liberated with me in Buchenwald. I did not know him. Uh, another prisoner. You know. He was like, if I ever reflect on him, he was like the skinniest kid that ever survived. I was not that heavy myself, but I was stronger. And uh, a lot of people who survived, they were barely holding their bones together. They were very skinny. It was already, wasn't everybody who just came a year, even a year, you could lose 50, 60 pounds. They didn't feed you. But there were other prisoners, the, the Polish prisoners were there two, three years, and they were just bones. You, you saw the pictures. They were laying there. The ones they didn't take out, they couldn't take them anymore because they were Muslim and they, and they survived. Even while they worked, they were just limbs, you know, very. There was no muscle or nothing on these people. And then uh, I remember a chaplain came and uh, they said he's a rabbi. That's the one thing I never forget. And he spoke in Yiddish, I couldn't speak English. And he says, Eben Ayit, Eben Aruf. It's the roof. We as God. Where is God? Look what happened. He says, the Kenish Fregen. So and you know, you don't have the answers, then don't ask the questions. Because I walked away crying from that man. Here's a rabbi, he comes in and he, he what are you coming for? Because if you ask him, I know all during life when I learned in the Bible, even when I was a kid, if you found something that was that made a, it was funny, you know, at home a hater. And you saw he beget who, he beget who, because this guy was fooling around with the other guy's wife. And he stabbed his wife through his back. So I asked the rabbi, how did he do that? He said the rabbi whipped you. <laughs> Why do you ask that question? about, it's not a clean question. And the same thing happened with this rabbi, who was a chaplain. He says, there are no answers to certain questions. If there's no answer, what do you come? I don't, the other answers I got, I see where I am. But the real answer is, where is, what is, whatever. Didn't bother. Forty years later, I'm at the gathering. He's on the podium, this rabbi. I'm sitting in the front because I know Mr. Strauss and he gave me tickets and I'm sitting there and I says to my wife, you know this, man? I know this rabbi from some place. I know this rabbi from some And I never told my wife what had happened till I waited till he got through talking. He, and he said that he was in Buchenwald at the deliberation. I went over to him. Do you know that he remembered me of, I made an impression on him that I walked away crying. I says, if you have no answers, don't ask no questions. Don't ask me if you have and, and you know, that was right at the podium when he walked off from the speech. I found that rabbi 40 years later, he was an older rabbi, he was the soldier chaplain that met me, first soldier that spoke to me Yiddish in camp after the liberation. That was maybe the 
wasn't the 11th, it was the 12th of April, whatever. And that's how we were liberated. We were liberated by the Americans, and, and then later on, the Eisenhower story is an extraordinary story, for one thing, to me, it's not to anybody else who was liberated in that camp, because when he came in, I, and they said, you know, this is the general that was in charge of this whole, Eisenhower was like God in Europe in those days, but it wasn't to me. But to me, he was a God because he saved us, and he came in there, and he looked like he was 10 feet tall, and I saw that he brought all the Germans from town to see the concentration camp, to see the dead people, to see the live people, to see the skin and the bone and the crematorium. And they couldn't get their food stamps stamped without that they were there. Now, he said, you know, because I want you, because everybody they spoke to, they said, we don't know there was concentration. How could they not know? And then uh, the reason to me it was because when I came to America, he, he, my first job was to take care of his clothes at 3G factory, that they made his clothes. And I said, Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, he liberated me. And now look, the odds of me being liberated is six million, and the odds, what are the odds for me making suits for him? And that was my job. So that's why it was a big deal with me, General Eisenhower. And since then, I dressed so many presidents that it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. And that is my concentration camp story finished. What happened to you after Buchenwald? After the, Buchenwald, the Czech 12. government came in. I mean, we were there for a while. The Czech government came in and took us back to a sanatorium because the one thing that I had, my father instilled, again, I always use my father because my father was the disciplinarian and he said, discipline. And the minute I got liberated, I can't tell you how many people died in that camp from dysentery, from stuff because they ate everything junk. And the minute the doctor came in, you know, from the American doctor to an interpreter, said, do not eat only what we tell you to eat. And guess what? That's all I ate. Whatever he said, and I never got sick. Most of my friends, they were almost died with all kinds of bacteria because your system was not there. And then the check took us back and they nursed us back that I gained my way back through the exercise programs, everything together. When I came in uh, after a month or so, the only thing that I had no hair, you know, because I, you know, we, we, they, they shaved your head. So I, I was just like any other person. I got a check uniform and I was ready to go into war to fight because the war wasn't over yet. I wanted to go back to fight. Did you? So, no, because by the time we got finished and stuff trained, Fatek. But some of the others, if I had gone to Israel, I would have been in the 48th war because I was prepared already as a soldier, young soldier. But I wore my uniform all through the search. And that's there. I had, uh, after the liberation also, uh, was able to get some cloth, you know, we found a warehouse with cloth, and I brought a few cuts of cloths to Czechoslovakia, and the tailor took two for himself, and he made me two suits. So I had some clothes when I uh, came back. Concentration can we brought English fabric back, that we found the whole warehouse, that we just opened up, and we took whatever we wanted. I mean, it was there. And, 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 and Weimar. And then when I came back to in Czechoslovakia from there, once I got healthy, then I left there to look for my family. That's all I wanted to see is my family. Find, find, find. I didn't know anybody who, like I told you, who's alive. And that's in 45. And then uh, I wanted to go home. Did you go home? Yes. 
and I never stayed in my house, somebody that lived there. I never went looking for the jewelry or for anything else. It wasn't important to me. I went to the cemetery to see uh, my grandfather, my relatives buried. I knew already about the people that were buried. I went to see them because the people were shot. That was my godfather and was like sisters of mine. And then I stayed one day. I did that all in one day, one night, and I never wanted to be there again. And then I left there, and I went to search from country. I went to Romania, to Hungary, to from country to country, wherever there were survivors, maybe they're sick or somebody, to look. And they had like, they kept on keeping names, and register people and stuff. Look, 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 and I mean, I couldn't find nobody. Where did you get the money to go from one country to another? What money? You went on top of the train and land the train any place. I traveled on top of the train from country to country without a ticket. I have no money. Who cared? What would they do for me? If, if I was in the train, I never had a ticket. I couldn't speak. I acted whatever I had to do. What are you going to do? They're not going to shoot me. So I traveled. We traveled. There was so don't forget that I had a uniform too. So they didn't even know who I was. I just traveled. That was no Did you problem. Did you go by yourself? Traveling. Yeah. I met other people. And then we we, we went, uh, and I found out there. First. We came home, we were a whole group, we moved together, and then we had nothing to eat, so we had to find a girl that could cook, and then we had to find how to cut a slaughter a wheel, so we had to have some money. So we started to, I forget how we started to trade cigarettes. We traveled from one country to another. We started to trade a little bit. Then we got a pig, we bought, but we didn't need the pig. So we traded the pig for a wheel, for a calf. And then there was nobody to cut the calf. And then one of us had to do that. Who is this group you're traveling with? Not, uh, you know, this was the group. Some of them say, uh, they're here, some of them, that... Uh, most of them are still alive there here. Shulam is the guy from my hometown. He's very religious now. He's in Borough Park. And another guy is, uh, just came, he was, he, he was left in Russia and he came over just last year or two years ago. I went to see him. That's when I went back home with my son. And then he's here and his wife is here. He, met, he married that same girl. They say they're related to me. I don't remember how, but if they say they're related, so fine. And, and they're here, one of them is in Israel. We were like 10 people, we moved in to somebody's house, not in my town, in Strabicho, another town. And then this, so finally there were two girls that cooked and I was the one that cut the calf and skinned it. And that was the first meat we had that they cooked. And then we found, uh, you know, uh, bread, uh, we were able to deal with, uh, we, we, we survived fine. Where were all these? boys and girls, survivors of Buchenwald? Mm, not Buchenwald, different camps. There was nobody there with me from Buchenwald in this group. There were only people, town people from home. The funny thing is that this man that was with me in Budapest, that when my father sent me with him, Yitzchak Mermerstein, he, I lost track of him. He was in a different camp, or. He wasn't hidden now. They took him from Budapest. And he was some camp. Or he hid out. I don't remember exactly, but I know one thing, that I never heard of him until one day I was married. and I was, A guy calls me, and I was like, I had just watched the news, 11.30. Watched the news on television. My wife was sitting there next to me, and the phone rings late. And I pick up the phone next to my bed. Hello? In perfect pitch English with no accent. This is Andy Martin. 
That was his name. Yitzchak Memer's name. Think about it. I said, Andy Mart. Yitzchak Memerstein, I tell him. He said, no, you, how could you know this? Somebody told you that I was in New York. I said, I don't even know where the heck you are, where you are from, how did you get to me? He was a plumber in Detroit. When he got here, he went into the army for two years, whatever, he had to serve. I couldn't get in the army because of my broken hand, because I, I was 4F. He was in the army, perfect pitch English, became a plumber from a cabinet maker, and he lived in Detroit. And he came here to look for people. And he found out about me, and he called me. He got in on Sunday. It was about 10 o'clock from Detroit. And then he finally, through somebody, gave him my number, you know, other landslide. And he called me Andy Martin. I said, how did I know that? I said, I'm psychic. I had to be psychic, because otherwise I would never know this. I mean, the man is older. I, I saw him in Detroit. Now he became so religious. He's a Shabbos. He wasn't religious before. He married. He lost his first wife of cancer. His second wife is very religious. So he's there. I couldn't even see him Saturday. I was working there. And I couldn't see him. And I didn't stay over Sunday. So that's my story. Well, let's talk about um, what you did when you went from one place to another looking for your family. Well, I became a trader. Uh, I became a trader. I started, as long as I had to travel from country to country, we had a little capital that we made together, some money they give you in a, maybe $50 or something when you were registered in whatever country you came through the, to the United Jewish Appeal, whatever, maybe it was a hundred dollars, I don't know. That, that money I bought cigarettes from, say, in, uh, in Czechoslovakia. And then I took it to Hungary and I sold the cigarettes and I bought, say, food salamis, loaded the suitcase and took it back to another country. Where, so before you know it, I built up a nest egg, money. Until the Russians started to rob us and take away the stuff, the borders they started. So uh, I, I stopped doing that, and then I didn't want to live with the Russians. I went back to deep Czechoslovakia, to Teplice Shanov, and I established a residence there. I went to a, to like a YMHA here, or Young Men Catholic. There was a youth center with no religion. And I lived there because I felt that was the best for me. I'm a lone survivor. I don't have to be obliged to anybody. And I started to work. We put together with two other boys. I don't remember their names of the other boys. And we said we're going to, I understand automobile mechanic work, and we could get prisoners that we could build new cars, new old cars, new, but they weren't building any cars from the, the German prisoners. And, we started to do that until the Russians wanted me to go back to my hometown. And then I went to this place, person camp, to Germany. I ran away during the night. And, and, and there, I, uh, from there, I, I started the Ali Al Survivors, Martin Greenfield. Let's talk about the displaced persons camp that you went to in Germany. I'll tell you a very interesting story that I just remembered now. See, in order, I already had a business in Teplice Shanov with these partners of mine. And when the Russians threatened to take us back, we had sold our first car in Czechoslovakia that we built for German prisoners. And that was deposited the money in bank account. I was in charge of the business. And I didn't even have time to go to the bank. To we never got that money either. To withdraw the money or anything. I just packed up at night and I was running away. And I took some, I had a girlfriend that time already, Sylvia. And I took her with me because her sister got married. She stayed in Czechoslovakia. Her family was her sister. And then I took her and a couple other people that we're going to run away through the border. And I got caught at the border, believe it, you never believe by who, by Germans. 
the guards, they stopped me and the guy came and I said, do not touch me. Shoot me, but do not touch me. Never again can you touch me. You cannot touch me. And I went wild. I went out of control. I just remember that now. That everybody thought that I was going to get shot, but I didn't care. You cannot touch my hand and you cannot take me. I could go back, I could go there, but you cannot touch me until they got the American MP and he saw I was out of control. The MP, they couldn't control me. No German is ever going to arrest me. I go back. And I went back. And there they were waiting for you, the Russians, but I had to sneak back into the woods. And the next night, I made my new approach with the same people I took with me. And we made it. We made it into Germany without them catching us. And that's how I got into the displaced persons was it Gavarze we found the camp or someplace and then I joined the Aliyah I, I joined the kibbutz first Shumir Atziyir which was actually was a lefty kibbutz because I remember they said that I, all the clothes I have they take away from me they wash it they give it to me I says no no I don't share my clothes with anybody otherwise I'm quitting the kibbutz right away so they gave me a privilege that I could wash my own clothes but I don't want to share my underwear, my stuff with nobody because I, I was very finicky about those things. I, in camp, I cl cleaned my stuff. It was always clear, crystal clear in here. I'm going to be a kibbutznik, but not with other people's clothes. So I already was, was special to them. <laughs> and they gave me more work than most of the people. But then we, we got trained, then I had to go back also on the border, bring other people, help them. You know. The Aliyah started. First we did to help out people who didn't want to be in other eastern countries to bring them into displaced person camps. And then later they gave us jobs to take people from Germany to transport them on the boats, like you know the boats, to get to Israel with the but they got arrested and whatever. And I was there. Through that time, I drove a truck. And since I was a good driver and I was young, they, they, they gave me this job to transfer people from Germany to, to Italy. I mean, I just dropped off the people, then they put them on a boat. And when I went back, they used to arrest me because it was illegally we stole those, the boat. And then they put me in prison. I slept there in the morning. At night, they got me out of prison. It was all a set-up job. And then I tried again every day. I mean, it was many trips that I took many people. Where did you go in Germany to where in Italy? Well, we went over the... We were in Wasserburg, our camp. And we went over the hills, you know, to... to northern or whatever Italy. We dropped them off had to be back with a, with a certain amount and we had two gas tanks, whatever they gave us gas to, to come back. How many transports were there? I, I made quite a number of trips. Were you the only one doing that? No. There were others also. There was a fellow by the name of Ivan we called. Uh, he was, uh, there were about two other people that did this from that area, unless there were other displaced person camps, they did it from it. And then I was going to go to Israel, and I, and I finished. And then I got this famous letter from a, an uncle of mine that sent a message that they, uh, somebody sent a message where I lived in Teplitz Shanov. This girl's uh, husband, you know, was a friend of my father, Goldstein, that he has a letter that I must come and get. That letter was from an uncle in Baltimore, that I found out that time that my mother was born after three sisters of hers and two brothers had immigrated and they never knew my mother. So how would I know them? And through this letter I found out and I showed that to Mr. Taub was in charge of this whole Aliyah. He was an American officer. And he said, you don't go to Israel on the last trip. 
you go to America, I'll help you get. And he arranged for my papers. Then I had a few more letters now to Germany from my uncle that uh, he informed me about everybody else who's other people that I have cousins and relatives. And I only think I remembered when I was in a home is something about a, a fellow from Mexico because these pictures that you see that I got, I found in Mexico City, my mother's brother. So I remember him writing something to me and I'm writing something to him. So I knew there was an uncle someplace in Mexico, but never in America. And that uncle and I became very close. And I, uh, after he died, he left everything to me, that uncle. Whatever he had, I mean, it wasn't a multimillionaire, but, but whatever he had, he left me. And uh, What was his name? Berger. Antonio Berger, because he was from Mexico. He was originally, he ran, I found out from him that he lived in France most of his life, and then he, he went to Mexico because he couldn't get in. He wanted to be in America with his sisters and brothers. Uh, there was friction there, because he blamed them for him not coming to America. So he settled in Mexico, he, hasn't, he had no children. So I was the closest thing to him, but he never wanted to come to America because of the stubbornness that when I invited him, he wouldn't come. He could have come, but he wouldn't. And he never came. My other aunt uh, was the oldest. I found out my mother's Elka. She lived in the Bronx. She came to the boat to see me because my uncle was supposed to pick me up. That road to me from Baltimore. He didn't make it. He was busy, you know, whatever. And Tony, uh, his name was... Isaac Yankel Berger. What, what time of year was this when you arrived? September 18, 1947. I arrived in America on a Sunday. And, uh, How did you feel arriving here? I was very excited to come to America because I, you know, I kept on reading about it then to find out about this country. And I so I was really excited coming in through the ship because when you come on Saturday and Sunday, I came on a, the Ernie Pyle, it was a transport ship. So I was very seasick, so I didn't want to go inside. And uh, so I stayed on the, on the outside, on the roof. We had this huge storm. I tied myself by the chimney. You know, the water comes, the waves come all the way to the top of the chimney. I know how I survived, but I had a girl there, you know. I found a girl all the time. So I tied her with me so her body kept me warm. <laughs> we survived together. But I have friends of mine who were on this ship. You know, Danny Freed, he won the, he won the lottery in California. He won three and a half million dollars. I was the first one he called because he won half of it. And I said, because he said to me, I just became a millionaire. I said, the only way you could become a millionaire is you had the ladder. He never liked to work in his life. I always helped him out. So he says, you're right, I hit the lottery. But I played the numbers, you know, the day, ta, ta, ta. There must be another son of a bitch that came on the same boat with me. He must have the other half of my lottery because he played the same number. I said, how do you know that? He tells me about how he won this lottery, that he has three sons and he's shopping with his wife. He had just retired. He never worked too much. He was a shoe salesman. He had just retired. He was 62. So, so I tell my son, read the numbers. You read the numbers. He gives him the numbers. He says, stupid, read my numbers. Not the numbers. They were exactly the same numbers that was on his ticket. Then he freed. In fact, I just saw him at the wedding. He says he gets... Uh, for $90,000 a year. Nobody deserved it more than Danny. He needs it more than he, he, he made. He's, he was on the boat with me. There's another girl that I finally gave a job to work. Her, she died of cancer. Her husband still works for me. I introduced it to her husband. He works for me. He's one of the supervisors. Then I had, from this boat, we were, I got a whole few of us that, that came together on the early pile. And then I came here to the Bronx first, and then this uncle didn't come for me, but 
I had the other aunt, Gussie's daughter, Frances, who's still alive. She's my only first cousin left alive now. She, uh, she's in her 80s, 85 maybe. She came over and she took me to Baltimore. And I stayed with them for a little while. And they had three daughters. And they were affluent because he was, uh, he was well to do her husband. In those days, he was a boundsman, you know, at real estate and whatever. I had a beautiful home, and my aunt cooked for me, like just like my grandmother did. Everything she knew how to do. Gussie and I stayed with them. They gave me a beautiful place. They had maids. But I didn't feel good because I had to go with the girls. They couldn't speak. I couldn't speak their language, and they were ever, they were like uh, handicaps. I, I got wanted to work. And they gave me a job with this Mr. Miller, who was an upholstering factory he had. But he could speak, he just came before the war from Poland. He could speak Yiddish, and I spent a lot of time with him, and I worked in his factory. After three weeks, I said, Mr. Miller, Timur Atoyibut, do me a favor, come over Friday night after dinner, because every meal in Baltimore was like a party. I mean, formal dining, that's how these people live. My aunt ran, uh, my cousin, she ran a home, beautiful home. And every meal was like, and, my, and her mother cooked just like my grandmother. She, she was in charge and they had maids. So we, every meal was, uh, Friday was finished, he came over, I said, Mr. Miller, I want you to tell my cousins that I love them. I want to go to my friend, Kalman, that we were liberated together. I want to go to his, to Brooklyn. And I want to, when I learn the language, when I come here, it'll be Christmas time. Now this is September. I'll be speaking English, but I gotta go to Brooklyn. And of course, Christmas, I came to visit them. I already had a job. I had a beautiful cashmere overcoat and three G's. And we came and I spoke. And I wanted to go to Washington to spend, there was a holiday, I wanted to be in Washington to see every museum and spend there. So we spent there eight days, my friend and I. That's when I met Senator Barkley. I didn't know who he was. He later became vice president, and he wanted to know about us, where we come from, what we do here. And he took me on a ride on that little car that they ride the senators. I didn't know he was. The old man was asking too many questions, bought us lunch, and later he became the vice president. <laughs> And I got letters from Senator Barkley. Can you imagine that? I love Washington to this day. Every time I go, I visit another museum back or something uh, of historic, uh, because I love the city. And then from there, I never stopped working with three Gs. I worked 30 years, and then I bought the business. What kind of a company is 3G's? A men's clothing factory, one of the finest clothing they used to make in America or in the world, maybe. I worked 30 years with them, and then I was determined, evidently, to own this business, and I did 30 years after for the business, and my two sons worked with me. And it's 3G's again, Greenfield, Greenfield, and Greenfield. It used to be Goldman, Goldman, and Goldman. And now it's almost 20 years that I own it. My sons, my partners, they, probably, they don't know it, but they own the business themselves. And I still work. I, I, I come in touch with, from Eisenhower, I took care of many other presidents for us because we do make fine clothing. Today, I am friends with General Colin Powell. And if you ask, Mr. Clinton, Martin Greenfield, he'll tell you who Martin Greenfield is because I go to the White House and I dress him. And uh, he, he, the Republican I dress also, Mr. Doe, but he doesn't know me because I, I do it through Brooks Brothers, but I do make all his clothes. I even made a special pattern for his shoulder and stuff. And uh, he buys all his clothes in Washington and Brooks Brothers. And, uh, Dress all the athletes. Shaquille O'Neal knows Martin Greenfield, you know. or any of the basketball big guys. They come. Even the new draftees. 
They, they bring them first to dress them up before they sign those big contracts. They want to look like they're rich anyway. And I dress those. And my life in America has been, because I worked all my life, I have never collected an unemployment check. If here, I never collected any kind of check. Everything that I worked for is what I had. And I, I, and I, there is not an American in this country that appreciates this country like I. How many people do you employ? <laughs> Uh, 200 and I have people and I and I bought three G's there were about a lot of people working there and I wanted to start a new factory not three G's Martin Greenfield my own name and I just wanted to make an X amount of units so I could make the highest quality that's my son is a dentist Jay graduated dental school and he works with me in average world the two my other son Todd went through, he wanted to be an arts lighting director, and, and he got himself a job, a stagehand right away, an assistant lighting director, and he works with me. So they really complement uh, the business, and they're very good at it, and I, uh, and I still work. Where I never you, stop working. Where did you meet your wife? I met my wife on a blind date. I was ready to get married because I was going out with, with a girl that wasn't Jewish you know, for many years uh, and uh, I figured if I'm going to do it, I better do it right. I didn't want to be a Jew anymore after concentration camp. But after a while, you, uh, you think about the options and everything else and I, for my family's sake dying, I figured I better stay true to my Whatever I was created, I'm going to stay. And the girl I was going with for five years was not Jewish. She wanted to become. I loved her too much for her to become a Jew because of my past. Who the hell would ever want to be a Jew if I wasn't born a Jew? Look what my Jews went through. I wasn't going to let her do that. And I told her family, there's no way. If she was Jewish, I would marry her. If she isn't, don't bring her into this damn religion because look what we did because of it. And then I... I figured all these girlfriends I had, and I had many, they're not working. I gotta get somebody to somebody. And somebody who worked, I asked everybody to do me this one, this one, this one. I met a few. And then I met Arlene. I figured she is it. Family, she. And then we, we, we really liked each other right away. And then we got married. That was already 1956. It's nine years I was here in this country. And I had a good life. I went to school, so I went to night school. Worked during the day, went to school at night, went out on dates, and never slept. And I was fine. I did everything here. I, I was all over. Traveled. Bought myself a car. First I built my own car in the factory driveway. And that was my first car. So all the people, my friends, they never had a car. I taught them how to drive. I took them out. When I came to America, I, I, I saw the people standing around in the Bronx. They were sleeping a sleeping bag. They were standing around. I said, my, I asked my aunt in Yiddish, Vus, that's baseball. Baseball, the Vartender, they're waiting to get in there. How many, three days, four days, five days a week? It was the World Series between the Dodgers and the Yankees in 1947. I said, that's the game I got to learn right away. That was the first thing I taught every refugee or friend of mine, I taught them the baseball game because I learned it. And I'm still a baseball now. Football, my sons, we have, I have eight giant season tickets. We tailgate, we go together. Baseball, boxes, we got every sport. Knicks, of course, Ewing comes to me and all the Knicks. So we dress them. The owner of the, Vil the, owner of the Mets, v Vilpon, is one of my friends, close friends. Because when he was a poor boy, I made him his interview suit. He never forgot that. Now he's a wealthy person. 
invites me on his jet, I don't even go flying on his jet. But I go to his games. And they announce always on television, they say our number one fan in New York is Marty Greenfield. He always tests me if I hear it. He tells the announcers to see if I, if I really listen and watch the games. Because I call him all the time about, I'm like, this. but they're nice, nice people. He comes to the shop, he's so close to the kids. In fact, they want us to have a picnic in the Shea Stadium. But as many people as I want to bring from work, they treat. But I haven't been able to work it out, the dates, that it works for everybody. So I have good relationships with a lot of people. They, they, I, I work for the community. I serve in my industrial park. I created the first industrial park. We have 22,000 people in Brooklyn. I'm still the president of it. I serve on community boards here just to know how to function in the government. I am involved with uh, many charities, even St. Nick's. I'm the only Jew that serves on St. Nick's board, one of the biggest Brooklyn charities, and I am also in charge of their finance. I'm in the Chamber of Commerce. I'm a director of Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. I just now got involved with the education department that I was in television on Channel 1 about from my vacation, I went into City Hall with the, you know, we went with the uh, chancellor I met for the first time and the, pres the new president of the school board. And they thought I did the greatest job because I, it's going to be a role model kind of thing. Business, help, educate. And I tested it out and they asked me to speak to the, to the graduating class of in my public school. And I had this great, I don't write speeches, I just prepare them, just like you, you know, in your head. And I, I wanted to know, raise your hands if anyone ever heard of the Holocaust. Not one hand went up. So of course I changed my speech to talk about other things. But that's why we have to talk about these things. Because the only incident that I'm going to tell you that a lot of people would have acted different than me, and then when I was working with Neiman Marcus and we go to this restaurant all the time for pizza for the first night Friday, we have a few beers and pizza with all the executives there. And next to me, I see they're shoving me to the side. I said, what, what are you pushing me? They were skinheads next table and they were talking that they, the Holocaust never happened. And when I see, why are you shoving me? See, the, I saw the skinheads. They don't bother me. They, don't, they better not bother me because they're a bunch of idiots, just loud, like I'm talking to you. And they say, well, yeah, they say Holocaust never. I said, that's why they're idiots. I feel sorry for them. I'm not upset with them. I feel sorry with them because that's what happened in, in Germany. They were just following leaders. And he could be the first victim of, of, of whatever could come. Because you never know where he falls in. He could be in some place where they don't want somebody like him with the, with the blue, white eyes. But more important is that he says that it never happened. And that's why I feel sorry for him, because he doesn't research nothing. He just, whoever tells him something, he believes it. And that is the biggest danger in the world. That's why I'm doing this interview. Because if you don't have history and nobody follows history, you don't know who the next victims are going to be in the world. And, and, and it, 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 it's, it, it's just shameful that a young person would say something never happened. If he doesn't know it happened, don't say nothing. I don't know. Did it happen? Didn't happen. It's, 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 it's never believe somebody who wants to just put you together if you saw this 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 picture of time to kill you know that they have now the book my wife didn't want to go she says we read the book the book is always better but this picture was written better than the book that was his first book it wasn't written as well as the picture and you saw what could happen with with Ku Klux Klan with followers with blacks and whites it's no different we don't know what's going to happen next and that, like Eli Wiesel went to Bosnia and, 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 uh, 
and uh, the one thing I said if I got liberated when I said I'm going to be a Jew and if I ever get liberated I will never never want to live to see another concentration camp of any kind and then Bosnia when this catastrophe happened the only thing that is different for me in Bosnia the feeling because a lot of people in America don't know the history of the Croatians, they don't know the history of the others, they were totally Nazis, anti-Semitic, they, they, they had many Jews killed and stuff. I don't hold it against them, don't, 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 don't. I don't, but at least you should know where they're coming from. You should know what people are. If the Serbs are bad, the Serbs were tough because my father was a partisan with Tito, and the Serbs were not anti-Semitic. They were anti-Nazis and they fought hard. And I knew that the, the president could go into that area. You cannot defeat the Serbs in their mountains. Hitler couldn't defeat them. And you're not gonna defeat them. We don't have the means how to defeat them. And Hitler had all the training with all the stuff, he couldn't touch them. So it's a shame about this concentration camp that we that they see, I never wanted to live another time that it should happen, that you should see something like this. And, uh, but I, I, I deal with life pretty good. I do whatever I can on my part, and my kids know that uh, we should help wherever we can. That's all. Thank you very much. So thank you. I hope that it's going to do something. Okay? On the left side of the picture is my mother, Celia. That was before she was married. And, and next to her is my grandmother, Gito, on the right side. I approximately, I don't know, because I was born in 28, it could have been in 1920, whatever, I don't know. And on the... This picture on the close-up, on the left side, is my mother, of course. Beautiful mother. <laughs> and that's my father. Could have been in 1926, 27. You got the top picture. I know it was taken in 19. 1936, I was eight years old. On the left side is my sister, Sima, and my mother, Celia, and I'm next to, in the center. And then my uh, sister, Rivka, and my father, Joseph. And on the bottom, on the bottom line, you see that I'll start on the left side is my sister Sima again. Gitl is my uh, grandmother, and of course myself. You see all spruced out there in the, in, in, uh, in the middle, and then my grandfather Fischl, and next to him is Rivka, and then my mother is in the background on the left side and my dad is in the back behind them and those are the pictures okay um august 11 1996 the survivor is martin greenfield the picture that is in front of you is my older son jay and his wife cheryl at their wedding that happened, I think, 1988, in February the 13th, that they got married.
ready. This picture that you're looking at is my younger son, Todd. Todd with one D and his wife, Bonnie. They were married August 18, 91. The next picture is, is my, uh, our granddaughter, Amy. She is six years old, and she's in love with me, and I'm in love with her. And this is my grandson, our grandson, David Taylor. And he is three years old, and you could see the devil in him. <laughs> He's quite a guy. Now here's the whole family picture. On the left hand side is Bonnie. Next to her is Todd. And in the background is Cheryl in back of Todd between Bonnie and Todd. And then my beautiful wife Arlene, which you didn't see yet. And next to her I am and our older son Jay is in front of us. Something. Well, the picture you see, of course, you recognize President Clinton, and I'm shaking hands with him, but that picture is taken in the bedroom of the White House first time I met the president, I was invited there to, to do some wardrobe for him and measure him. Originally, I was invited to have breakfast with Hillary and him, but uh, with the president, meaning him, but her father had a stroke if you, uh, if in, 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 in Arkansas, and they both went back and they canceled my breakfast. So uh, after a while she couldn't get back, so the appointment was without her. I never got to meet her, and I did the president, and I had to wait for him a while before he came into the bedroom. I have met presidents before, but you, you get very excited when you're in that White House. If you have never been there, if you ever get there, you'll find out you cannot believe the feeling. It is just a something very extraordinary to have for a person to have this opportunity because the first thing when we shook hands I asked the president how do you feel being president and he looked at me I said is that a stupid question to you that I asked and I'll tell you why I'm asking you the question I met presidents before I got so excited to meet you so I want to know how it feels to be president because I know I'm never going to be able to be president. So he says, you know, it's not a stupid question. I think it's a great question. That's how we first met. I went through his closets. I went through his books, what he reads. I left my stories. I've been written up myself uh, in different uh, New York Times and other articles that they write about me, about my skills and about my, what I do as a person because, of course, I'm... I think that I, I make the finest clothing in the world. That's why they seek me out. He never wore tails in his life. I was the guy that measured them and, and put them into tails and showed them how to wear them, faxed him all the uh, how to tie a bow tie and how, because he told me he's a very honest guy. He said, I never wore tails. I don't know how, what, when, and I had to show him, and I did. I uh, I told him the story with Eisenhower that I when I uh, I don't want to go through the whole story again because it's on tape already, but I did write notes to Eisenhower and I put them in his pockets, especially during the Suez Canal when the French and the English were fighting uh, Nasser. I sent a note to the president because I shipped some clothing to Eisenhower. Why don't you send dollars, your secretary of state on vacation for one week or two weeks and the war is going to be over. 
So my boss was at the White House. He was invited. In those days, I didn't own the business. When I came back, he said, how did he like the suits? The president loved the suits, but there's somebody here who writes notes in his pockets. I said, well, I, I write nice notes, and I give him good advice if he would only listen to me. So uh, it got out, and it was written up already. After a while in the Times, I became famous that I write, Taylor writes notes to his president. That's the little story about my president. Well, this picture is with General Colin Powell, and of course, I also dress him. One day, maybe he'll be president as well, like Eisenhower. He, I met him when he came back through a cousin of his, who was a good friend of mine, and he introduced me to him when he came to the parade, if you recall, after the war, that, uh, that he was responsible, sort of, or maybe he was the general anyway. And they gave him this big parade in New York, and I met him in the wall of a story. We had breakfast together. And he said to me then that in October, or whenever I retire, I have no clothes, so you'll have to put me in my next uniform. Well, I, I, well, I certainly did. But since then, we've become friends because he, came, he comes to my shop, and he showed me a woman. He had tears in my eyes, in his eyes, and he says, you see this lady there? She does the same job as my mother used to do when I used to come home from school. And then my father, I love to come to this place because this is how my parents worked in the garment district. And that's how I used to get a sandwich from their boss, he used to have a sandwich ready for me after school. And I used to come and visit them. So he's very, we've become close. I've, I've been, I was invited to his home in Virginia, me and his wife Alma. She, she makes me breakfast whenever I'm there, when I work with Neiman's or something. And we spend a lot of time talking and chatting. In fact, the last time he called, I was in California, and he read one of my articles or something, and he said to my son, Todd, tell your father what I said, Mazel Tov, on the article. I don't know if you know what it means, but he knows what it is. <laughs> because he... He, he wanted to congratulate me in Hebrew. So we become great friends. Uh, I'm not his political advisor, but I knew before a lot of other people that he wasn't going to run. Because why should he put himself? <laughs> he's, he's, he's. So, but uh, one day I hope he'll be president. He's a great guy. Good. So this here was a really big surprise. Two surprises I got from my wife. One of them was my 40th, and I have nothing to show you about the 40th, but it was really surprised in her parents' house. But this one, the 65th, I was surprised being 65. I feel so young. And then at the inside, you see, she had this invitation made because it's a double-breasted jacket, and inside with the tie, and you read, at the Friars Club, I was honored. And I came to that Friars Club, and I guarantee you, just like we go normally for dinner, and I said, we're gonna have dinner in the Friars Club with the kids, and there they are on the steps. All my friends are close relatives. <laughs> they filled the club, whatever they allowed, and it was really a surprise. It was really a huge party for me that I'll always remember. not doing me anyway, so I could have my glasses, it doesn't matter. We're rolling. Okay. Can, you see this article in the New York Magazine section of the New York Times? I read the Times all the time, wherever I am in the world, I get it, so I'm sure a lot of other people read it. So it was a great thrill to be written up in the Times in 91, and I had just was going to start to work with Donna Karen. The article is about me. You see, they call me Tinker Taylor. Sometimes I don't know how much I think and how much I tailor, but I, I, I enjoy my work, and a lot of people know uh, I was written up many times in the Times in different areas, but this one describes a lot of 
it was done nicely. Among uh, this article that was written, I had several others, but I think I would like to, to uh, uh, there's an article that was written about me. The next one I think that I'm gonna show is, uh, was also something nice. I could make it without a cookie. Yeah, I just bend it over. Yeah, I don't want to it's it. fine. We got a few magazines. If you put them in plastic, then the acid in the paper won't um, yellow it. It is fine, Marty. That's very good. That's good. Mm -hmm. See, this article was written. In uh, what was this magazine again? In the Parade magazine, and it was done in '94. '94, and I thought there was a great article about me and about presidents that I, they say, measured the president, which I really did. Many people ask me about the president's measurements, and just like a doctor because they call me anyway Professor Dr. Taylor. I never reveal those numbers to anybody. I keep them with my, myself all the time. And the article that this guy wrote, he, he described me pretty well and about, the, uh, about my skills. And uh, I, I, I enjoy doing work for other people as well as not only presidents, but the reason that they always seek me out is, is it has to do with the quality that I produce in my work. You see, when I said I was a doctor, you see, they write the suit doctor. That is, the guy came in to me because I really, in my factory, when people follow me around, I'm like a doctor in a hospital. If, if you go to see a doctor, you would understand that better than when I talk about suits. Uh, if I go to a doctor, the guy gives me a pill. When a suit doesn't feel good that I don't see how it looks right, I know how to get the cure for it. And I'm good at my skills. That's why they seek me out and they, they, they write. And I'm very proud of my work, the pride you could read in this. If you read the New Yorker and you know how well they write, I was really proud of this article. He did that in 20 minutes, that man. And he described me the way I like to be described. So thank you. Well, I'll introduce my beautiful wife, like <laughs> I promised. She's put up with me. <laughs> For how many years is it? It's going to be 40 years. This is a mistake. I'm only 25. <laughs> it's all propaganda. <laughs> so go ahead, honey. It's well, yours. <laughs> well, they, they say that a situation either makes or breaks a person. And I think what Martin went through uh, has made him the man he is. He's, he's a man of the highest integrity. Honest. He's honest. He's compassionate strong-willed, and after 40 years of marriage, believe me, he's strong-willed. <laughs> and uh, all I can say is I, I, I empathize as much as I, you know, I, I can cry when I think of everything he's gone through. And I love him, and I would love another 40 years with him if I could get it. I don't know what else to say. That's it, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good job.